Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Robert Baylor, Director of Communications at NUCA. Welcome to our second NUCA Construction Law webinar. First, before we begin, some webinar housekeeping for attendees. Today's webinar will be recorded. It will be available on NUCA's YouTube channel and our Construction Law webinar webpage, both of which can be accessed via NUCA.com. All participants are muted upon entry. Phone participants can use star six to mute and unmute themselves. Questions will be asked at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, you can submit a written question at any time using the chat feature, and I'll read them at the conclusion of our discussion. Now let's get started. Last year, NUCA's legal committee decided to hold in 2023 a construction law webinar every other month to discuss with NUCA members current legal topics affecting the utility construction industry and our members' business operations. The committee's second webinar will discuss late utility relocation. Late utility relocation is the number one cause of delay on highway heavy projects around the country. Since contractors don't have contracts with utilities, a contractor's experience is that there is nothing they can do to stop it or otherwise get paid when it occurs. But does it have to be that way? Our speakers today say no. There are tools contractors can use to minimize late re relocation and when it does occur, get paid for the related extra costs. Tom Olson and Sean Farrell, well known to NUCA members as voices of authority on construction law. Tom is chairman of the NUCA Legal Committee and practices law in Minnesota as a founding partner of Olson Construction Law PC. Sean provides legal counsel to NUCA of New Jersey and is a partner at Colin Seaglass PC in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for joining us today on this NUCA webinar Wednesday. Tom, I turn the webinar over to you. Great. You know, I want to clarify as a starting point too, while uh, Bob was accurate in terms of where Sean and I are based, you know, we perform work representing contractors throughout much of the country. So the presentation today is focused not specifically on either of our home states, but rather for general application around the country. So if you can listen with that in mind, um, we can go to the next uh, slide. That's who we are, younger looking mud shots of us. So let's <laughs> move on. Not so young anymore. Go to the next, please. So, you know, as we like to point it, death taxes and late utility relocation, seems like those are three things that, that are inevitable. You can't do anything about. Um, and as Bob said at the beginning, um, as I'm sure most contractors know from their own experiences, you know, pr probably the most difficult, unmanageable problem on highway heavy projects around the country is late utility relocation. Um, in fact, I, and I, we just sort of cited the source there, but as recently as 2018, Federal Highway expressly recognized that uh, late utility relocation is the number one problem around the country, along with unmarked, mismarked utilities. So. The problem with it is, you know, one, it's regularly occurring, though, two, it's not as though on public construction projects, you can include money in your bid for the cost of late utility relocation. First, you wouldn't know how much to include in your bid for it. Two, if you did, invariably, you wouldn't be low because others would. So given the that you ain't got money in your bid uh, and can't have it for late utility relocation, the question is, is there anything that you can do either to prevent it from occurring Otherwise, to get paid when it does occur. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, as a God fearing person, um, I do recognize, uh, based upon my experience of working for what is it, 38 years right now in the hierarchy of life, there's God, and above God are utility companies, and above utility companies are railroads. Um, and I, I say that sarcastically, but I think probably most people listening in would have the same view. Um, Although, and I know from my standpoint, the, the takeaway is if God ain't answering your prayers with regard to utility related problems, chances are the utility isn't going to because my uh, view of life, uh, utilities are above God. All right. And they certainly act like that. All right. Next slide, please. So the question is, is there anything that can be done to either prevent late utility relocation or if it occurs to get paid for it? Um, the good news is, based upon the, the years that Sean and I have spent working around the country dealing with pro this problem, um, we have developed uh, uh, some tools to, one, help prevent late utility relocation in the first place, and two, to the extent that it does occur, uh, provide you with some tools to get paid. All of this is structured in the context of trying to uh, get these things handled cooperatively on the job site, not in a courtroom or otherwise, you know, in confrontational settings. All right, next, please. I'll just add to that. You know, one yeah. of the reasons why I think Tom's right to say that uh, utilities might be above God is 
they are very politically connected. They're doing a lot of work in these municipalities and these towns, and they know who the decision makers are and the stakeholders. So while we go through this PowerPoint, we're gonna give you a roadmap. It's really important to follow it because you're not playing with an even hand. They've got the advantage and you've got to take it back from them to protect your profit. Right, in other words, as, as Bob also said in the beginning, the challenge that I'm sure some of you are saying to yourselves is, well, but what can I do to prevent it or to get paid for it insofar as I don't have a contract with the utility companies? And again, the good news is our, uh, the roadmap that we're gonna provide recognizes that and nonetheless provides you effective means to deal with this. Okay. And, and right. I also wanna add before, before we go on, while most states, it's true, you don't have a, a contract with a utility, some states you do. So like if you were working in the city of New York, there you would get into, as soon as you get awarded a, a, a public uh, project with the sewer line or utility work at all, you're gonna, if there's other lines in the way, like Con Edison or other gas lines, you're gonna get into an interference agreement. This section U of your contract, you're automatically gonna be negotiating with those utility contractors. But quite frankly, you're gonna have the same issues and this roadmap that Tom put together this PowerPoint is exactly the same thing I would advise them. Uh, so when we walk through it, you're going to see that you've got to be proactive with all this stuff. Turn over to you, yeah. Tom. And I want to add to that, Sean. Um, how states deal with utilities, either by regulations, um, by statutes, uh, by DOT uh, specs, as well as you know the consultants varies so, so much from state to state. So, you know, one takeaway of this should be that it would behoove you to have somebody, yeah, your own lawyer or Sean, me, whoever, uh, you should have an analysis done for those states in which you're doing projects to find out what are the applicable rights and obligations as it relates to unmarked, mismarked utilities, as well as late utility relocation. The beauty is once that work's done, you know, you can have it set up in your office uh, in order that you can, you know, uh, proceed on an informed and proactive basis. Okay, all right, let's go forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the starting point. And it's, this is a real breakthrough. The utilities gained the right to provide, to, to place their utility line in the public's right of way pursuant to either franchise agreements, easement agreements, sometimes referred to utility agreements, as well as uh, sometimes ordinances. And I might also add, what happens often is after a, a city enters into a franchise agreement with one utility owner, uh, what's very common is that utility agreement, that franchise utility agreement will then be embodied in a an ordinance. Uh, so um, in, in any case, and what's so, so important about uh, each of those, both the agreements as the ordinances, if we turn to the next slide, is that those agreements set forth rights as well as corresponding obligations. And notably what's important to recognize is none of the consulting engineers, DOT, federal highway engineers that certainly I've come into contact and Sean can share his experience are knowledgeable about what we're talking about. None of the these engineers are aware that they have agreements, ordinances that empower them to obtain uh, timely utility relocation. So what we're providing to you is not just important for you to understand, to educate yourselves, but the goal to make the most of these tools is to also educate the project engineers, those that are doing the design of the jobs, as well as those that are in charge of during the build phase. And, and back to this, these agreements that have established the right of the utilities of place lines in the right of way uh, almost always contain important obligations. So in exchange for the right to place the lines in the uh, city county right of ways, the utility owners are under obligations that are twofold. One, to relocate upon request of the owner and and when and how soon they have to relocate really varies from agreement to agreement to, to ordinance to ordinance. Sometimes it's defined by a number. A utility has to relocate within 10 days upon request of the owner. 
Sometimes it's, you know, defined more uh, generally. Uh, utilities have to relocate on a timely basis. Utilities have to promptly relocate. But in any case, what's so important is the agreements like the ordinance set forth uh, obligations on having to relocate within a, a stated period of time, as well as two conse financial consequences, such that if the utilities fail to relocate within that time, that the utilities are responsible to pay for their related extra construction costs. Yeah. If you want to add it. Yeah, yeah, if I could add it. So I just took a quick look at, at, at some different ordinances just to give everyone a difference of a, opinion as to what your local ordinance might say. So I looked up the city of Patterson in, in New Jersey, and there it says under their ordinance, all owners of underground utilities shall promptly, shall promptly, what does that mean? Shall promptly, when notified by the city of a conflict, take the necessary steps to protect and or relocate their utilities. That's the provision that I'm going to go to and that Tom is talking about to say that you have an obligation when you have a contract with the city of, of Patterson that they have to take the action to go to that utility and put them on notice. And then the utility has to act promptly, which is a whole you know, issue of fact as to what's promptly. Now, if you juxtapose that to like the city of New York, I mentioned them before, there under the New York Administrative Code, it says within 48 hours of notice from the city, they can issue an order out and you have to act within 48 hours to move that utility. That's a big difference to have one say, move it within 48 hours and another say, move it promptly when you've got a schedule that you've got to keep to. So you should know that up front before you're getting into the contract, what your rights are with respect to uh, relocating utilities and that time impact that it could have on, on your uh, schedule. And certainly it's my view and really great information here, Sean. You know, I would define promptly as, you know, in a time frame such as not going to interfere with the timely prosecution of your work. But as Sean said, you know, that language like that, you know, typically aren't defined as to what exactly constitutes prompt or promptly relocating. But in any case, it does contemplate it being done in a time frame again. It's going to be quick, Just, however you measure that, as opposed to, I know, for example, I was working on a bridge job where uh, the, it was, we, we, before we could start the bridge, we had to demo the existing uh, communication company had their line running underneath it. The project was scheduled to start in April. Of course, if you're building a new bridge, the first activity is what? Demoing the bridge. The utility company didn't uh, relocate until uh, November. And I and I've heard, in fact, Texas, uh, one project utility didn't relocate for two years, which is to say that as we go through examples of how long it can take, um, that really underscores the importance of not only educating yourself on this, but educating uh, project engineers because they don't know, as typically contractors haven't known, what we can do to either prevent late utility relocation or, or get paid when it occurs. Right. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. Again, we've gone through this again. It's and the beauty of it, again, I just want to emphasize again is the ordinances and like just what Sean read, um, in large part, really do a good job defining the obligations, defining the obligation not to relocate, but when that relocation has to occur, as well as to uh, the obligation to pay the extra construction costs if the utility fails to do that. I want to say one other thing, and, and Sean made this point too. Every single ordinance and franchise agreements that I agreement I've reviewed requires that the request to relocate not come from the contractor, but rather from the city official, which is another reason why as contractors, you know, we need to educate the engineers that they are the ones ultimately that have to be the mouthpiece requesting it. You know, ideally they're doing that at the design one call phase as well as doing that at the pre-con as well. But, but if they're not doing it, you have to document it as well. Right. That's good. Right. right. And, and I'll add one thing, because I know uh, some people in NUCA do a lot of uh, pipeline work, uh, had some experience with that as well. There's a whole different thing. We're talking about franchise agreements and we're talking about ordinances. In pipeline work, a lot of times these utilities have permanent easements. 
And that's a whole nother nightmare because a permanent easement is I've purchased the land for value. I've paid some money and I have rights as, as a land owner. And then the cost to put it onto the utility contractor to relocate is not as simple. It makes all of these things even more prominent and more important to follow if you're doing pipeline work to figure out whether or not they have a permanent easement, a franchise, or an ordinance that's in play. And ideally, to the extent that you're working in uh, certain areas uh, with some frequency, the goal is that you're going to get educated on, you know, what are the applicable uh, franchise agreements for the utilities that you're regularly dealing with, as well as the ordinances that might also apply. Yep. Okay, next slide, please. Um, again, we've talked about that. Next slide, please. Um, this is this is how to prevent late utility relocation at the build phase. I really would describe this as first at, at the design phase. In other words, part of what we need to do is educate the owners, uh, the engineers rather, on the existence and use of these. So, you know, what I encourage contractors to do uh, for the projects, you know, to the, the engineers you're dealing with is to educate them on the use of this. You might even give them a copy of the PowerPoint if that's okay. We're not going to get in trouble with NUCA. Um, but otherwise explain to them, hey, for the, when you're doing your design one call, to the extent that you encounter utilities that uh, uh, respond that they may or do have utilities within the limits of the project, that the part of what the uh, engineer should be doing at that design one call phase is to uh, pull together the ordinances the uh, or the franchise agreements and the city county should have copies of the franchise easement agreements in their uh, file cabinets and find out, you know, what are the corresponding uh, obligations for each of the potential utilities and the project limits as it relates to relocation. And, you know, ideally what the, the engineer is doing during that design phase is then um, notifying the uh, utility companies as well. Hey, look at, you know, to the extent that you have or might have a utility within the limits that could uh, interfere with the project work, you know, attaches a copy of the franchise agreement, you know, for you and please be please be on notice that pursuant to section blank you've got an obligation to relocate upon within x period of time upon request from the owner and two for section blank if you fail to do that you're responsible to pay for the uh, extra construction costs so the goal is for the engineers to take control and use these tools at the front end so to the extent we can actually manage utility relocation ideally get engineers to establish a relocation schedule uh, prior to the time that the project is even put out for bid. I want to say one other thing that about that too is that another reason that contractors you need to be educating yourself on what's happening in each state. Some states, for example, have regulatory and or statutory schemes that, that uh, address this more fully. So for example, in Iowa, there's a, a regulatory scheme for relocation as it relates to uh, DOT projects. So, uh, again, you know, there, there's really a, a need in, in the context of everything we're talking about to educate it on the tools that you uh, should be using. Sean, do you want to add anything before we move on here? Yeah, I would just say that when you're making this request of the engineers and you're educating them, you got to structure the letter such that if they don't take action, that that's going to have consequences for your individual project, that it's a different site condition and that you're going to be entitled to additional time and or additional money. You got to analyze it as to what the end here is. And the end is to protect the company from loss. And that comes out of, is this going to cost me more money? And is this going to cost me more time? And, you know, I want to add one other thing, because, Sean, that just made me think of something. Some, some public construction specs provide that as it relates to uh, the work of uh, third parties, such as utility companies, that a public owner will only be liable for extra costs incurred because of, for example, late utility relocation if the owner was negligent. I see that more and more. And what's important is it seems to me that if you put the engineer on notice of the existence and use of these tools to prevent late utility relocation, that if the engineer fails to utilize those tools, it certainly presents a, a pretty good basis for arguing 
that if late utility late, late utility relocation occurs as a consequence of the engineer not using these tools of which you made the engineer aware of, that that could constitute negligence. Not that yeah. we want you in a position going after the owner for money on the basis of negligence, but even being aware of that might allow you to make your communication to the engineer that much more powerfully heard and acted upon by the engineer. And, and it doesn't have to be adversarial. I mean, a lot of the contracts that I see, the specifications will actually exclude exactly what Tom was saying, which is I, as the owner, am not responsible for delays to this project from third-party utilities. They say it outright. And they say go, especially in states like New York, where you have to get into an interference contract with the utility to move their own utilities. You've got to get out there with those letters and apprise them of what's there. And by the way, sometimes you have situations where uh, you're giving a unit price in an interference contract with the utility. It might not cover the known conditions that you think exist because of other work that should have been, you know, taken out earlier. And and all of this is necessary. You got to tell the engineer, hey, now they're interfering with my work. Now you have the obligation to do an order out or to advise them that they have to move pursuant to this ordinance or franchise the utility. Get them to do it. Right on. You go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, again, for the contractor, if I'm low, if I'm low as a sub or a GC on a job, you know, um, before I go to the pre-con, I want to make I'm going to make sure a standard operating procedure that for any and all of the utilities that are identified that 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 have or may have utility lines in the project, I'm going to be requesting from the engineer a copy of all the applicable franchise utility agreements. And to make sure that I've got those tools with me, such that before I go to that precon, you know, you know whether the engineer was aware of these tools at the design phase or not, I'm going to make sure that as a contractor, I not only get these franchise agreements, I not only uh, read through them to understand the, the the obligations for each of the utilities with regard to utility relocation, but also I'm going to make sure prior to that precon, I'm going to go through those agreements with the engineer. So the engineer is on the same page for me, which is to say, prior to going to that precon, the engineer understands that it's got tools to accomplish uh, timely utility relocation. All right, let's next slide, please. And again, Sean, if I want to add something before I go on, please do so. Sure, um, doing great. And we've just gone through this, but the key is well, prior to that precon, educating yourself as well as the owner, and you're going to want to make sure. Uh, that, that the engineer is actually making copies of those agreements as well as you having copies. And I would be highlighting the relevant language as it relates to the obligation to, to uh, relocate and the consequences for failing to do that on a timely basis. Yeah. And, and to do the same thing with any applicable ordinances for the city or county in which I'm working. Okay, next slide. Okay, and again, we're at the pre-con. You know, ideally, we've had that. You know, we've educated ourselves, we've educated the engineers on the applicable franchise agreements slash ordinances. Uh, we've got copies of those, and at the pre-con again, because all of these ordinances, at least that I've seen, and franchise slash utility agreements contemplate that the duty to relocate is triggered when the city or the county requests it, that relocation. It's important that you, as a, at the precon, ensure that not only the engineer uh, uh, knows that, but too that the engineer is the one requesting that. Or otherwise, if you know if you're requesting it, to have the engineer say as a matter of record at the precon, "Hey, look at uh, the you know the the contractor is acting on our behalf right now in requesting this." So, for purposes of your duty to relocate, a, con a request from the contractor is going to be treated as a request by the city or the county. I think this is an excellent point by Tom. I had a case a, a few years ago where a contractor had a combined sewer overflow project, went to a pre-com meeting. Thank God the pre-com meetings were incorporated as part of the contract. So the questions and the answers at the pre-com meeting became part of the contract. And it was asked whether or not the gas utility would move all active lines. And everyone was given assurance that that would happen. And you know it didn't. The gas lines weren't moved. They were live gas, they had gas in it, and it delayed the project unbelievably long for over a year and a half uh, as a result of that. And it was really because of that pre-con meeting 
the uh, recording of what was said and incorporation into the contract that the contractor was able to come out of that okay. Uh, so these pre-con meetings, I, I agree with Tom, are of the utmost importance. Anything that's said or anything that's used and having the utility there present at, at the pre-con meeting, which they were in, in the case that I just told you about, is, uh, is critical, critical, very important to document that. Yeah, I mean, it goes without saying that I can't, at the pre-con as a contractor request either directly or through the engineer timely relocation unless I have an understanding as a matter of schedule what that would look like which is to say I need to have an idea of when I'm going to be starting work such that I understand when the utility has to relocate so you know, you're going to want to have that schedule worked out in terms of the start of your work Prior to the time going in there, if you're a sub, you got to make sure that the GC and you have already worked through you know, the scheduled start of your work in order that you can, you know, properly request, you know, when does utility relocation have to take place in order for it to be timely? Um, I want to add, obviously, a point that Sean made. Uh, well, two, a couple of other points. One, when you request that utility relocation, uh, either directly or through the engineer, from each of the utility companies, it's it's important as well to get a commitment from the utility company at that point. You, one, do you understand that? Two, are you going to do that? And two, to the extent that somebody, a utility company says yes, again, as Sean was saying too, you got to make sure that the meeting minutes that are prepared subsequent to that reflect that commitment by the utility company. Because if I'm gonna if I'm gonna move iron to the job site, on the basis that the utility is company is committed to relocate by this date, you know, I set myself up for getting paid for idle iron. If, you know, if I mean, not only for a breach of the duty set forth in the agreement, but another tool that I can give you is uh, there's a, the, the law that reflects a, a right in many states for uh, with regard to uh, potentially getting paid for late utility relocation uh, based on negligent misrepresentation. Um, so, for example, if the utility company re represents at the pre-con, hey, I'm going to be relocate by this date or within X period of days of being requested or whatever you s accomplish, um, if the utility company fails to do that, you know, at least in a lot of states, you potentially have another tool by way of being able to predicate a claim against utility for negligent misrepresentation. And one point I want to make about that is, you know, a, a claim against the utility company for, for negligence. Uh, misrepresentation. The goal isn't to use those claims to litigate this. The goal is to put together those claims as part of a letter if, in fact, you have to go against the utility company to get paid for late utility relocation and put that together at the front end with the goal being that by way of having all of your law in place, having the application of that law to the facts here, um, having potentially even your lawyer, if necessary, draft a summons and complaint to get attached to it. The goal is that you can get the utility company to act cooperatively if it fails to relocate timely and to resolve the issue up front. I will tell you, I've got a, a project pending right now where that's exactly the approach that we did. The utility company was late, very, very late, a, a whole construction season late relocating. Um, um, we prepared a letter under our stationary and signature uh, outlined the relevant law, applied the facts of that, uh, attached a summons and complaint, and rather than getting back either the FU from the utility company in words or the, the equivalent by way of, you know, no response, the utility company hired a very good construction lawyer, and the construction lawyer said to me, send me the support for your extra costs. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, there really is an opportunity, folks, to get a different result by taking a different action. Sean? And to, to add to that, and I'm sure this is what you guys did. To, you got to make it easy for the utility company by setting out the law and, and, and what their obligations are. But also, if you're directed to do that work, to relocate the utility for them, keep it all on time and material. Have it all packaged up so that you can shut this down at the project level with a change order. Yep, yep, yep. And I, and I know, you know to the extent sometimes you've got uh, contract provisions that might apply and or regulations or statutes you know, might also be important. I know when I've been in one state where they had a regulation applied that gave the contractor a right to get paid from the utility company for late utility relocation. 
it's my standard operating procedure in that state to have the contractor send the, the, the letter to the utility company as well as the project owner and explain, hey, not only that you're delaying me, but also I, uh, I'm going to keep, here's how I'm going to keep track of the impact. And let yeah. me know whether you want me to track it differently. Otherwise, I'll uh, understand that this is a reasonable way that's acceptable to you to track the impact both time and dollars. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Again, and, and again, Sean makes a really important point, uh, which I you know confirmed. You got to make sure after after that precon that you got meeting minutes that that reflect this. And I will say not only that, but anything of importance that that was brought up during that precon, you got to make sure it's in there because so often, um, the, you know, the engineer whoever's charged with preparing those minutes fails to do a good job encapsulating the important points that were made during that meeting. And then, and the second point I want to say is, you know, again, one way that utility companies can give you the uh, the fu is also simply not going to precon. So, you know, we got to make sure that as contractors, that if they don't come, that the information that was communicated at the pre-con is communicated in writing to them, including application in reference to the, the franchise agreement that, that, that sets forth the obligation for the utility company to relocate. And two, when uh, on behalf of the owner, you're, you're requesting utility relocation pursuant to that, with the expectation that whatever the terms are as to when that utility relocation occurs, that in fact, you expect that to occur. And that if it fails to, that you're gonna cite the relevant uh, provision and the ordinance and or the franchise agreement as to the obligation to pay for the extra construction costs incurred for untimely utility relocation. Okay, next, please. Um, so what do I do? You know, again, I'm sure some of you are thinking, yeah, Tom, I can, Sean, I can do all that, but you know, Again, God, utilities, railroads, they're not going to listen. Um, you know, again, the, the first part of this is how to use these tools to prevent or minimize late utility relocation. Those same tools can be applicable to get paid for late utility relocation. Again, you know, you need to get educated on, as we said, you know, what are the, the, the applicable regs, stats, statutes, contract provisions? Again, it, it varies from state to state. Um, as I'm sure Sean can help you, I did a uh, an all state uh, uh, examination of this a number of years ago, so I got a pretty good collection, at least as a starting point. If anybody's got a question of what uh, regulations or statutes or contract provisions that might be in play in in your state, but again, you need to find out for those to see whether and to what extent you know statutes, regs, contract provisions give you a right to get paid. Yeah, let me also add that you can create your own lock. I had a, uh, a contractor who was fantastic. He was doing a, a, a wastewater treatment plant down in the city of Brigantine in New Jersey. And with all this information and after, you know, uh, 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 pre-con meetings and everything else, he tied his schedule to when the utilities would be relocated. So they were milestone dates within his schedule. And that made it a lot easier to get time extensions and additional compensation when those dates were missed. So not only did he do everything that, that Tom had laid out, but the schedule that they asked for up front, he tied within their milestone dates to the relocating of the utilities, which you is know, a great also, idea. Yeah, I might also add really, and again, it's another point Sean made, you know, really getting educated on this, educating the engineers on the use of these, can really go, I think, a long, long way in improving your relationships with the public owners and engineers that you work for. You know, you're providing a, a way to minimize or otherwise resolve this problem that plagues utility projects all around the country, and um, you know, really the opportunity for you to be someone that's making uh, a, a notable difference in how this is handled in the places that you work. Okay, so we just listed some possible sources of payment. For late utility relocation, again, you got to get educated on what's in play potentially in the area that you're doing your project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, I might add to the extent that the that, that you have some statute reg or, or contract provision on point that gives you a, a, a right to get paid. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough. Make sure you identify the procedures that are required to get paid, and two, you follow them. 
Um, I could be on my soapbox, as I'm sure Sean could be. That <laughs> goes for any issue. Um, you know, so often if I get involved in a pay item basis, I'm having to try and uh, get around the failure of the contractor to do what the procedures are. And, you know, I just can't emphasize enough, learn what those procedures are and follow them. Um, because if it's your experience is anything of mine of 38 years, you might be substantively entitled to compensation, but if you fail to follow the requisite procedures, you know what you're going to hear. And, and even if, and even if there's not an ordinance or a statute that's allowing you to have the relief you need, I mean, Tom has brought it up a few times and it's on this slide. You might have a negligent claim as well. So that's when they're just the ordinary standard of care has fallen below what they should do. There are, we could go on for a whole presentation about the economic loss doctrine, but many states provide exceptions to the economic loss doctrine through the restatement of torts that would say when a professional engineer is being paid for his work or her work, knowing that others are gonna rely upon that, you can have a negligent misrepresentation case. I can tell you, Pennsylvania does that and has said that in their common law. So it depends on where you are, but don't give up just because, uh, you know, there's not necessarily a statute right on point. There is always an equitable claim through through negligence and tort law that you should also explore. Yeah, and again, a couple of points on that. Again, the goal is to, you know, if you have a negligence claim against the utility company owner or a negligent misrepresentation claim, the approach here is not to utilize or to, to assert that claim in litigation. The goal is to, you know, put together the claim that 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 as you communicate to the utility owner, if we don't resolve this cooperatively, here's my roadmap to get paid in court. And I don't think utility owner, you want to have a precedent set in this jurisdiction of having this thing go to trial or to a successful motion for summary judgment. Two, I want to add. Um, that um, in the when, when I've looked at this issue in a number of different states, the, the, the a claim for negligence is predicated on a duty being breached. And what's so nice about this conversation is um, the franchise agreements and ordinances uh, typically establish a duty as it relates to the utility relocation, such that if the utility owner fails to relocate pursuant to the duty that's imposed by way of franchise agreement ordinance, that provides a basis for a negligence claim. So you're not having to try and get a court to establish a duty as it relates to utility relocation because that duty is already established by way of the franchise agreement, the ordinance or otherwise. And again, the, 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 the project that I'm working on right now, uh, uh, it's based on a, a claim for negligence uh, insofar as the uh, utility failed to relocate in accordance with the franchise agreement there. And again, that's the one where, you know, uh, through a letter that was about three or four pages from us, um, you know, setting forth where this case was going to go, if we would have to sue it out, utility owner through his attorneys and saying, okay, just give me your, give me the support for your, for your extra costs. And uh, which says to me, we're going to be able to resolve this without having to file suit. And hopefully the goal is as we start to successfully do it with this. Well, for example, with that utility company, the assumption would be any contractor dealing with that utility company would follow the same roadmap and get the same result. And I'll just add, while it's never the goal to go to litigation, you know, depending on the cost of this, you know, utility not relocating their lines, you might have to go and do some upfront work. I had a case recently where we the 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 city was not ordering the utility to relocate its its utility lines i don't know why we wrote all the letters it wouldn't do it we had to go into court this was in new york it's called a cplr 78 proceeding meaning that you can force the government to do something that they're not doing they have an obligation to do it and it's hurting you uh and we made them issue what's called in new york order out orders so they had to order out the utility to come out and relocate the, the, the lines. And that upfront litigation wasn't on the claim or the money. It was just saying, hey, city, you must issue an order for the utility to move its lines. You're not doing it. Led to a broader discussion and packaging of a claim and settling out those relocation costs 
without the need for litigation. So sometimes, again, depending on what the claim could look like and how, uh, how you require this uh, governmental body to do its, its duty to force the utility to move the line, you might wanna look at that as an alternative as well. Yeah, I know today we're talking about late utility relocation. Um, you know, just as bad or sometimes worse can be, you know, inaccurate utility information. And I know in a, a big case that I had uh, with, you know, CenturyLink, um, you know, the, the information they gave at the design one call was inaccurate. And, you know, as you might or might not know, the information that, that you're going to get at the, the build one call is the same information that the engineer gets at the design one call. So if it's an accurate at the, the design phase, it's going to be an accurate, inaccurate, the build phase. We got, you know, what should have been high production uh, uh, job turned into man, largely manual because utilities were strewn throughout the, the work area. And uh, we had to file suit against CenturyLink. And I'm proud to say we got a, you know, I think one of three cases successfully holding utility company in the country liable for inaccurate uh, utility information. But again, you know, I think the, the, the key takeaway today is the goal is to, you know, you to get educated on the use of these tools to resolve your issues, either prevent the problem of late utility relocation in the first place, or if it otherwise occurs, you know, to get paid for it quickly and cooperatively. Okay, one other move, next slide, please. Um, you know, we just talked about this. You know, the goal should be to, you know, use these tools to resolve the issues cooperatively if and when late utility relocation occurs. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, death taxes and late utility relocation, this problem, you know, is going to, is an all too regular part of your projects. And, you know, the good news is we've got some tools for you to use, uh, not only on your own, but you should be using in conjunction with the engineer. And um, we're happy to say that you, can obtain a successful results, both preventing, minimizing late utility relocation and getting paid when it occurs. I don't have anything more to you, unless you do, Sean. No, I think the next slide would be questions. So I don't know if anyone <laughs> uh, asked any, any questions. Uh, maybe that's a question for Bob. Uh, well, uh, th thank you, Sean. Uh, let's open the webinar to questions. You can either use the chat feature to submit a question and I'll read the question to the presenter or I saw one a hand come up. If you prefer, unmute yourself, state your name and company, and ask the question directly. Remember to remute yourself after you finish. Yeah, hi. Uh, I asked the question. My name is Eric Smith. I'm with Aiken Gardner Construction on Chandler, Arizona. And I was wondering if I have an issue or I had an issue with some downtime with a, a mismarked or unmarked utility that caused some downtime. Um, I was denied the claim. I We had documented all our... Downtime, uh, 23 emails later with two responses, I was denied because I had no uh, tangible loss. So with the lack of the lack of their doing their job and locating these utilities, would that be would that fall under the breach of duty contract, uh, breach of duty, or the economic loss doctrine? Yes. So that that and that happens a lot where. You know, you you call eight one one and they mismark it, and the utility doesn't know where its lines are, and therefore, the damage that you suffer because of that is the downtime, and that is an economic damage. That is not personal injury or property injury, which would be covered. Uh, so the economic loss doctrine says if you're seeking purely economic damages. You can only sue under a contract theory. You can't sue under a negligence theory. Now, there are exceptions to that uh, in certain states. But under that general premise, and I, I don't know about Arizona, but if you're subject to the economic loss doctrine, you, you do have that issue. Now, what you could do and what, what I've seen some clients do is they keep track of those uh, claims that they have and the downtime that they have. And then when they're guilty of hitting a line with that utility, they can they try to enter into a, a mediation, if you will, and try to offset the costs that are associated with their own fault of hitting a utility that they should have known about versus the downtime that they had. And I've had a lot of clients have success with that. Uh, but there is a true economic loss doctrine, again, assuming that Arizona follows that, uh, that prohib prohibition from suing under a theory of tort when your damages are economic. Tom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a couple more things. First of all, you know, 
you know, as a contractor, one of you, you know, the big costs of like utility room location is idle iron. And, you know, part of this is educating owners and engineers of, you know, my, I was low on this bid because all of my iron was costed on the basis of being used. I ain't got any idle iron contingency in my bid. And I, I will just say somewhat sarcastically, um, even to the day, I still find engineers that don't understand how idle iron is a, a compensable cost. In other words, my one of my favorite phrases I ever heard when I started years ago was an engineer saying, well, how can that be costing you money that iron's just sitting there? It's like, exactly, <laughs> because either I'm paying for it or you're paying for it. So one, you know, again, the goal is so often your responsibility is to educate owners. And then two, again, you know, one common way that I have successfully gotten help contractors get paid for unmarked, mismarked utilities is under the different site condition clause. So if there's not any contract limitation as it relates to the right to get paid for unmarked, mismarked utilities, uh, the, the best place to normally the best contract clause for that would be um, the different site condition clause. And I will say something about that. It's really important to educate yourself because that clause is going to be near the same in any state, it's going to require you to give notice in writing, not verbal, other than a federal project. You got to give it in writing. Otherwise, you're going to be screwed. Two, have to give notice to the engineer in writing. You got to stop work in the affected area, allow the engineer to investigate it, determine if it's a DSC, if it is, whether and to what extent it's impacting other work. Too often, the contractors fail in two respects on an otherwise legitimate differing site condition claim. One, they give verbal, not written notice. Two, they don't stop work in the affected area. So you, you know, do what it says. And and if you're like, hey man, I don't want to have my iron sitting idle. Two thoughts on that. One, to let the engineer know after you give notice. Hey, look at, you know, can I continue to work in the affected area without you know adversely affecting my rights under section blank of the differing site condition clause? Because to the extent that my iron sits idle, it's only going to increase. The cost of the the expenses for which I'm seeking payment for, ask that. And if the engineer says yes, make sure it's in writing. The other thing is, again, it's also important for you to get educated for any of your projects that you're doing, whether to what extent you have a right to get paid for delay. Um, some clause contracts don't. Some expressly have a no damages for delay clause. Um, I will tell you the right to get paid for delay sometimes can be hidden. So, for example, under DOT contracts, um, at least every DOT spec that I've looked at, the right to get paid is hidden under the clause that's entitled suspension of work. So, although the project's not suspended, that's normally at least on a DOT project or where the DOT specs are incorporated in the job. It's under suspension of work clause because that clause says almost in every state, if the job is suspended or delayed for an unreasonable period of time, you got to write for for dollars for it. And my experience in using that is to the extent that I have a delay attendant to late utility relocation, that would be unusual, even though we know it occurs all the time. And, you know, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, Sean. Or... No, I, I think that that's a, that's a good answer. I would also just add that all the, uh, the notices that Tom's talking about, and he says in writing, emails can satisfy that writing. So, Put them in emails. They're non-offensive as opposed to getting, you know, in, in today's day and age, a letter on your letterhead uh, and save those somewhere where you can find them. Yeah, and I know sometimes the engineer will get pissed at the contractor. The contractor's uptight. I don't, you know, I'm just starting the job. I don't want to adversely affect it. It's like, hey, look at, I mean, this. these are the, the rules of the game that you got to follow. So if the engineer gets mad at you, what are you doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm following the contract. If you don't want me to follow the contract, just put that into writing. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, that helps quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And what again, questions. What? Gentlemen, I don't see any of the questions popping up on the board. I don't see anyone raising their hand. So that's probably it for questions. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> you, you were very <laughs> thorough. <laughs> I think somebody's oh, hands there, going there up. There is a question. Rick. Rick, I think you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead and try now. Rick? I see the hand up. I see the hand up. 
trying Maybe to. Maybe just waving goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's what the little hand on the bottom of the screen is for. <laughs> well, we're certainly available for an email if anybody's having difficulty. That's what I was going to say. And you know, one thing that I hope to do, and we've talked about it before, is to the extent that anybody has success in utilizing, you know, anything that we've talked about today, it would be really helpful for not only folks in your area, but around the country, that if you would share that with NUCA, in order, in order that we can build on that. So, you know, if you've dealt with this engineering firm, it'd be great to share, hey, I here, you know, I, I, I followed this and here's the success that I had with this engineering firm, or here's the success that I had with the, you know, uh, you know XYZ utility company. Um, you know, the goal is to, you know, to the extent we can, expand our standard operating procedures and achieve, you know, increasing yeah. success with that. You know, yeah. the, the benefit of that is it's going to be easier going forward because when problems do arise, you know, we're, you know, it's easy for you to say, hey, look, we're going to follow the same path that we have before. Yeah. And I'll add to that, that, uh, you know, Tom and I have had a lot of uh, discussion about using, you know, other states uh, because of our relationship and our, our knowledge on different states to benefit contractors. For example, if I'm representing a contract, a contractor in, in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, well, I might wanna know about a success that was in Minnesota. Why? Because we're always, as you have to educate engineers, if things go really bad, we have to educate a jury or we have to mostly educate a judge. And if I can say to a judge, hey, listen, this is the same fact pattern, pretty much the same contract, and in Minnesota, that judge agreed with me in my interpretation. So why would you here, even though it's not binding on you, why would you here disagree with him? And that is persuasive and influential. And that's one of the benefits of being part of NUCA is we have that ability to collect all that information and use it to protect contractors wherever they are. Yeah, I mean, for this, this utility owner that I'm dealing with right now, you know, assuming as I, th I think we're going to be able to resolve it cooperatively, you know, m my advice to the contract is going to be to share that within, you know, in this state, you know, not only does it have a NUCA chapter, but also the AGC. Let them know, hey, here's the roadmap we followed and it succeeded. So. Tom and Sean, thank you very much for your time today. It's really this absolutely fascinating discussion. I never realized uh, minutes were so important. Um, we would also like to thank our many national partners for generously supporting NUCA and our monthly webinar series. Today's webinar has been recorded. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the NUCA.com website and on our YouTube channel over the next few days. I'll also be putting the PDF uh, of, the present, of the PowerPoint up on NUCA.com, hopefully by the end of the day. And thank you for your time today to join us for this special industry webinar and for supporting NUCA. The next construction law webinar will be held online on July 18th. Thank you for your time this afternoon, and please enjoy the rest of your week.